Welcome to Empire Building, the podcast where we talk about building big businesses and even bigger lives. I'm your co-host, Wendy Papazian. I'm Sarah Reynolds. And I'm Tiffany Fikes. And we are so excited for today's episode. Two of us, I would call our problem-solving junkies. And (laughs) we are going to work on how to kick the habit. Sarah, can you relate to that title? I gave it, I, I call myself that. Yeah, I mean, Wendy had to basically enroll me in AA for problem solving junkies a couple of years ago and helped me a lot in this area. But I have been addicted to solving problems and really getting a rush from it or what it was, but a true like sense of pride that I solved lots of problems and realizing that it caused actually a lot of harm in the development of my people. And so this is definitely a topic that is a very powerful one. And if you can get a hold of it fast and early, it will, you can impact a lot of people's lives and develop them much faster. Well, I think it's really interesting, especially in the real estate industry, because we, as we grow our teams, we start out by solving all the problems ourselves. You know, I know, Sarah, you actually joined a team, but, you know, Tiffany and I, we started out as solo agents. And so you are basically a problem solving machine when you're in this industry and really any sales business, you're just a problem solving machine. And if you're an owner operator, which is how you start out, you're just trying to fix things all the time. And so it kind of makes sense that as you bring people onto the team, you're just going to continue that role because, you know, for some people, they've been doing it for five, 10 years before they actually even hire someone. So it's just a pattern for them. That's so smart, Wendy, because when you first get your license, I was taught that the best realtors are the best problem solvers. Like the difference between a average realtor and an exceptional realtor are the ones that can solve people's problems or solve the problems throughout the transaction. So you go from that when you are actually performing the function of a realtor and have pride in that to then starting to build your empire with that same mindset, it really is a bit tricky to sort of work your way out of it. And so that's a a very smart correlation, Wendy, because I didn't think about it from that perspective. Well, and maybe that's why I don't suffer from this as much because, you know, I built my team right away. I mean, I had help Mm. literally with the first deal that I did. I hired that transaction coordinator and I had a part-time assistant within the first year. So I've always been delegating. Well, and I would say it's a strength of yours because I was the same way. Mm -hmm. And I still, when I hire people, I have to call (laughs) myself a problem solving junkie, which is why I developed these stages of communication was to like, help me kick the habit. But I heard a Steve Jobs quote this week that I thought was really interesting and I want y'all's take on it. So he says, it's easy to hire people and tell them what to do. It's hard to hire people and have them tell you what to do. Hmm. What? Why so good. for you ladies when you hear that why is that hard? Well, we are ego machines, so there's that. We think we're amazing. We think all of our ideas are the best and yeah, so like when somebody comes to us and has a different idea, sometimes that that bruises our ego. Yeah, and I think entrepreneurs in general, like when you ask them like what made you start XYZ business or what made you get into real estate? I mean, a common thing they say is I didn't want a boss. Like I want to be my own boss. And so like you go from having that mindset of starting your own business, your entrepreneurial spirit, entrepreneurial mind, mindset, and then wait, my people are now my boss. I'm reporting to them or, or they're the solution makers. That's not why I did this, you know, is uh, I, I think a lot of why people struggle in this area. Um, I, I struggle, I think, for different reasons, but I, I for sure think it's like the foundation of why someone got either into the business or started their own business was to not have to report to someone else. Yeah. I think when you hire people, you think I'm the boss. I have to have the answers. Like they're on my team because I am so smart or I know how to solve the problems. Like it's a skewed value. You think that your value is in the answering of the questions. And so for me, I think that's a part of it too. Like, well, I've got to show my value here. Like this is why I'm the leader is because I can solve all of these problems. And it feels... I guess that is some ego, but it's more to do with the value, your value in the company. Well, I'm just kind of having an aha here is, you know, I think the gift that I got was Jay had been working with Gary for about 10 years and he would go to these masterminds where, as you guys know, you guys 
go to all the masterminds. And what does Gary talk about the whole time? It's basically like get out of your own way, hire people yeah. that are better than you. That's the only way you're going to grow. And so I think for 10 years, uh, Jay was probably coming home and sharing some of that with me. So I probably started my real estate business with a more of a mindset that way. The great thing is, as you're thinking about this, whether you're like Wendy and this is not a struggle for you at all, there may be people on your team that it is a struggle. And so you can help them with this. But also I want, if you are like Sarah and I, I want you to think about what do you get out of people coming to you and you solving the problem? Because until you can really identify that feeling that you love or the, like what's your high that keeps you addicted to the problem solving? And so like, that's your first challenge. What do you get out of it? Because you won't change it until you can identify what's your high that you're Mm. getting out of this. So good. Okay, so let's jump into the framework around how to move your people through these stages of how to deal with a problem so that you can kick this habit. So I'm going to run through them really quick and then we'll go one by one. Well, and I just had one more thought before you were, sorry, I didn't interrupt you, but I also feel like it's weird because when I hear people speak in a way they are like this, they're addicted to problem solving and they have this duality of wanting people who take more initiative and more leadership, right? So that's why this is really important because if you are one of those people who's like, yeah, I I recognize that I've done this and I have people in my world that I've maybe trained them to always come to me and solve the problem, you need to just like think about these levels that Tiffany's talking about because you just can't have it both ways, you know? That's so true. And I think a big thing that we haven't mentioned as a big why, and I know for me has been a big why, and before we get into the five stages, is speed. Like when we talk through these today, and I will tell you as a recovering problem solving junkie, it takes longer (laughs) now to solve problems because I follow these stages now. And before, when someone would come to me and ask me a question or have me solve a problem, I could solve it within minutes and move faster. And we moved very fast then. And part of my sort of addiction was the speed of Mm. of moving. And so like, I think I, I want our listeners to really hear me on that because I think many of our listeners, the reason you listen to this is our title, right? You are into building a big business, a big empire and a bigger life. And a lot of times we want it fast. We want it now. We want it yesterday. And so what causes us to want to solve it right then, fix it right then, and not teach our people how to have their DNA in the solution is because of time. And I will tell you, and I, I really want our listeners to hear me, I will tell you that it actually in the long run takes longer. You think you're saving time because you solve that one problem fast, but because you're not teaching your people how to think, how to do it, how to bring solutions, you're actually prolonging the development of them and prolonging the growth of your organization. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, and here's my last caveat. I guess, why did I even start introing this? We all had really important things to say. Um, My last (laughs) caveat with these stages is you may say, oh, I don't have a problem. But as we go through these stages, you need to look at how people on your team are communicating. Where are they in the stages? Because you may realize you don't think you have a problem, but people are not communicating with you in a way that they are taking the problem solving off of you. So I challenge you to listen to that too. So let's run through the five stages of how to deal with problems. So number one, the lowest level is people just ignore them and don't communicate them to anyone. Number two, next they stage. They ignore the problems. They, they just, yeah, they just ignore the problems. Yeah, got stage it. two, they communicate problems to you. Stage three, they communicate the problem and they bring you three ideas. Then stage four, they communicate the problem. They bring you three ideas and then a recommended plan of action from those three. And then the fifth stage is they communicate the problem, the three things they thought about and what they have already done to solve it. So I want to go back through all five of them. I just wanted you to have that framework and then we're going to go one by one so that we can dig into what those really look like. 
All right. Well, the first one is, you know, they just ignore the problem. I mean, this is obviously, you don't want this person in your business. If there's a problem that happens, they just, they're like an ostrich and they bury their head in the sand. And um, not, not only are they ignoring the problem, they're not communicating them with anyone who can help them solve the problem. Yeah, it's crazy. I didn't think and usually we don't hire those kind of people in our business because we've figured that out in our hiring process. But there are so many people who just think, oh, I'm not going to deal with that. Like I had an issue with my gym and I emailed them and said, hey, there was a billing issue. And one person said, hey, I'll get, you know, I'll look into it. And then I never heard. I emailed again and just said, hey, I wanted to follow up on this. No one ever responded. I emailed a third time. No one ever responded. And I'm like, I know the people who own this gym. And so I called the owner and she was, of course, appalled that the person who was running the email box never brought it to her, never asked for help. And so like stage one, unacceptable. Wow. (laughs) It sounds kind of great. (laughs) Don't you wish that's how we could do it? Just ignore the problem. I have no capacity for that. Yeah. So ignore the problem. It like speaks to intent, right? Like meaning like they are choosing to ignore it. Um, Mm. I have this like false sense of like, I think everyone has good intent. Every human has good intent. (laughs) And so what I have found through discovering when a team member does ignore a problem, when I sit them down and I say, hey, why did you ignore this? Why didn't you bring it up? Why didn't you talk about it? A, if you study the disc, high C's tend to ignore the most problems because they are fearful. They feel like they did something wrong and that they would get in trouble or that they like they might not have full capacity to do what the job is right now. So they don't say that because they feel like they're doing something wrong. They're working mm-hmm. hard. They're putting in the time, but they're afraid. And so building a culture of safety where people can speak up is also critical here, obviously looking for that before hiring them. And what can happen as you grow is that their job outgrows that one position. Mm. And so it's not, they don't intend to ignore. It's literally like they're fearful. And so I had to work on creating a more safe environment for someone to say, I can't get to all of this anymore, or this is a problem I'm running into to where they don't feel like they're going to get fired or they don't feel like I'm going to be angry at them. And so just be aware of like the intent behind it is a lot of times not of just ignore. It's actually more deeper than that, but it's definitely a, a, can be a common stage for sure. I love that. So smart. Well, it's kind of like when you have a, a rental property, I mean, I always say to my tenants, Hey, If it's a little thing, even if it's a little thing, just tell me about it because I'd rather deal with the little thing or I'd rather be the one to say yes or no versus like you just ignoring it and not telling me about it. So I learned that from you, Wendy. I love it. All right. Number two is really they're not ignoring the problem or they understand that there is a problem and then they're communicating the problem to you or to their kind of superior, I guess. But what they do is they come and it almost feels like complaining a little bit where they come to you and they're like, wah, wah, you know, this is a problem. And then, you know, you have to deal with that as the owner or as the manager or whatever. And that's exhausting. If you've got a big organization, you've got a bunch of people doing that all the time. It's exhausting. Well, and I always think of like, whose turn is it to talk? Like they come in and they say, well, this person just quit. And then they think it's your turn to talk. Like if they present a problem and then they think it's your turn to talk after that, you know, like that's the signal of, okay, that they're definitely at level two. If they come to you with a problem and then think it's your turn to talk, Love that. that's level two. Love that. Okay. So number one, they ignore the problem. Number two, they communicate it to you and they expect you to solve it. Right. And that's where the junkie comes in. That's where hero, yeah. da, 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 hero of the day. <laughs> I'm here to solve the problems. Bring me your problems. I will solve them. And so that's typically where it stops when you are a junkie <laughs> is that stage. Okay. <laughs> stage three is they communicate the problem to you and they give three ideas that they have in terms of solutions. So they identify the problem. They come up with some solutions. They come to you and they say, okay, we have a problem. Here are the three solutions. So we actually just had this happen uh, a couple 
I have a confession. Before Her Best Life, I never experienced a room where everyone wanted the best for me without needing anything in return. Many of us have battled burnout and exhaustion lately and just feeling alone. I know I have, which is why this year's Her Best Life flagship event in Miami is tailor-made for us. Here, we not only grow our businesses and leadership, but also forge connections with like-minded women returning rejuvenated and fulfilled. If you, like me, have felt the weight of burnout in the past year, I want to extend a personal invitation to join us in beautiful Miami, Florida this September. Head over to herbestlife.com slash events before we sell out. Hope to see you there. Weeks ago, where um, we have tracked appointment data now for f- over five years, like detailed appointment data. We have an inside sales team of about 30 amazing um, inside sales agents, and their job is to book appointments for our agent partners. So in the data, I saw a trend where the percentage of listing appointments took a huge decline. Actually, the leader of the inside sales department saw the saw the decline and said, we need to talk and came to me and as well as my chief growth officer and said, you know, we've had a decline last week in percentage of listing appointments. And I've spoken to the ISAs. I have a new leader of this department and she's shining right now because she collaborated with the ISAs and came up with three solutions. So she got their buy-in, which was brilliant and came up with three solutions and they were spot on. They were awesome, but that's where it stopped. Right? So that's the third stage is identifying the problem, bringing it to you, and then coming up with three solutions. So that's stage number three. Now, stage number four is they communicate the problem to me and three ideas you have for solutions, and they recommend one plan of action. So they will recommend, okay, let's change X, Y, Z in our process. And so they come up with one part of sort of the plan of action. And I think, Wendy, you sort of had an example of this recently, right? Well, my new, I mean, I have a lot of, I feel like I have a lot of great people who kind of own their roles, but I've got a new executive assistant and personal assistant, and she's really crushing it in her role. She's just been there two months. And she's done this multiple times. Like when I was reading through this, after you sent this, Stephanie, I was like, wow, she's done this multiple times where she said like, hey, here are your three options. And clearly like, the first option is like the one that's best. And then she'll just send the email like, yeah, and I like the first one. And as someone who makes a lot of decisions every day, it's such, what a gift, you know, Seriously. it's such a gift. You can just look through the options quickly and like, yeah, the first one does seem really good. Thank you for taking the brain power and the time to think about it. So it's a game changer, guys. It's a game changer. You just, if you've got, you know, we did an episode recently on decision fatigue, which I think that was your amazing episode that you wrote, Sarah. And in that, we talked about this idea as an empire builder where you're making so many decisions day after day, especially if you've got kids and you're, you know, in a partnership and you're just making a lot of decisions. It's great to have someone in your world who's like, hey, I used my brain to think through these things and I just need you to sign off on it because I already did the thinking for you. Super helpful. Saves a lot of brain space. Especially if they're the one that will execute it. Me- meaning, yeah. you know, I had to learn that when I was solving all the problems, when I was that junkie of like, okay, solving all the problems, it also was almost perceived like I'm the one to execute on the solution as well. Mm-hmm. And so what I love about what your EA is doing is that she's owning not only the thinking power that's allowing you to have more brain power to actually grow yourself and grow the people around you, but also it's owning the execution of it and not putting it back on you. And so that's so powerful, life-changing, truly. Yeah. So good. So then the final stage, level five, what we all want our people to get to is they come to you, communicate the problem. They tell you the three things that they thought about and what they've already done to solve it. I have the best, I literally have the best example of this that's ever happened in my organization. And this is when April Mitchell was there. She was my director of operations. Amazing. She now runs all operations for Keller Williams worldwide. She's a total rock star. And we had this situation where we had an inside sales agent who sent out a message to every single person in our lead nurture database. It was like over 
7,000 emails or something like that. And people were unsubscribing, unsubscribe, 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 right? Because they, this inside salesperson sent out this weird, I don't know exactly. I don't even know what it said. I didn't need to know because this person solved it for me. But what was happening was April was actually, she was at a conference in Charleston and she was flying back. She was in the air actually when all this was happening because agents were reaching out. They were messaging her. Hey, what's going on? I've got people that are unsubscribing. And so like when she got her layover, she was able to actually execute a plan that she thought about in the plane. And she called me later and she said, Hey, I just want to let you know what's going on and what I'm doing about it. And so she walked me through like, this is what happened. And then she said, here's what I did. First of all, I reached out to our CRM just to get a list of everybody that unsubscribed. And I was able to sort that by the agent. I gave each agent a list so they could call and ask them to subscribe again. And then this happened and this happened and this happened. And then she's like, this, and this is where we are with it. Like all these things have already been executed. And I was like, what? <laughs> I See, love you so much. That's yeah. amazing. You didn't even yeah. know there was a problem. I didn't even and, know. Until it was solved. Yeah. Okay. Can I be really authentic right now? Yeah. When I read stage five, I do not hear angels singing. Does it give you panic? <laughs> Tell me. It does. It gives me major panic. I don't like it. I don't, like, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't hear, I hear like, <gasps> Like, just, okay. Like, be, okay. It, it, so <laughs> angels this with is asphyxia. a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Sarah, if you had moved your people one by one up these stages and you for months had heard how they thought and what they were going to do and you agreed over and over and over with their decision, like, you know, nine and a half times out of 10, they were making the decision that you would make. Then would it feel better at level five? Because you know, you've got the background of knowing how they think. Yes, you're right about that. Because my COO, now that you're saying that, I don't ever have that feeling with her. And it's because of my trust in her decision making. And so you're spot on about that. And so taking the time to understand the way they think, I think is critical, is what I'm hearing Tiffany say. And that's the gold of these stages, is I either want to solve it, I want to control the problem. I want to do it all. Or I don't even want to know that it happens. And so sometimes I would move people to level five too quickly. They hadn't earned it because I hadn't thought mm. about, like I hadn't, I hadn't understood their thinking long enough. And so like level five is not a level that anyone should come into your organization with. They should move through these levels with you or you should move them up, you know, in their levels one by one. Because when you get to level five, that's, this is how talented people really want to work. True. But you as the leader need to have the trust and you've earned that at stage three and stage four. Well, and you know, Keller Williams tells us that the, one of the things we do as leaders is we teach our people how to think. And if you've had people that have worked with you for a long time, which I know you have, Sarah, you think the same way. You really yeah. do. You know, I've got people in my organization that have been there like the longest is eight years. I mean, that's, more than half the time I've been in business. And he thinks the same as I do. His thought process yeah. is very similar to mine. And it's because over the past eight years, I've helped him teach him how to think, how to problem solve, how to be that person who can solve problems in the right way. And will there be times where you're like, shoot, I wish you had, you had asked me? Yes, there will be. There will be. And will they make mistakes? Yes, probably. Are they going to make that mistake more than once? No, never. Never. Yeah. And that's just part of leadership. You know, that's yeah. just part of leadership. If you're just going to control every decision that everyone makes, you might as well work alone. You know, Gary Keller had like quote what his description of me is like, he's never met someone on, on the pursuit of excellence as I am, meaning like I demand excellence, which means like a hundred percent. Right. You know, and my dad has been working with me on this. My dad is like a leader. I just respect and have learned so much from. And he helped me identify, you know, Sarah, if it's 80% right, you tell them that was amazing. Like that was the right yeah. call to make because the minute you tell them they did something wrong, they're going to start. That's when you actually start getting that problem, all the problems back. You go, you go they down, the down, stages, go down, they go the down levels. the stages. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, you're spot on. Tiffany is like, they earn the right. And also the time of developing them 
as you pour into them, you're developing how they, how you think you're learning how they think. And as they move up in the organization, in terms of trust level, they have get more authority with what they get to all the problems they get to solve. So I love the way you put that. Well, thank you for, and thank you for being vulnerable there, Sarah, because I know a lot of our listeners, they feel the same way. They feel like they want to have everything, not just a hundred percent, but 110%. And the reality is, is that's not what a successful life over time really looks like. It really isn't. It isn't about getting a hundred percent on the spelling bee. It isn't about getting A's in all your classes. If you show up and you do 85% of the work every day, you're going to look up in five years, 10 years, 15 years, and your life is going to look pretty amazing. Yeah. You know, so it's going to look pretty amazing. Yeah. Love that. Well, and so some of the magic of this is in the concept of three ideas. Like, You may be thinking, oh, I do that. My people bring me a problem and they tell me what they think I should do. And and I would push back and say there's a lot of value in these three ideas because number one, it's exactly what Wendy, you just said, like you're learning how they think. And to Sarah, your point, you and I are learning to trust them (laughs) once we start seeing that they think well. But the value of it being actually three things often also pushes our people to think more creatively about solutions. Because if they know they have to come to you with three solutions, even if there's they've got one that they feel really good about, the fact that they even have to think through what else could be the solution, what else could be the solution. We all know that you get to the real new way of thinking, it's it's rarely the first idea that you have. The first idea may be right. 91% of all of our thoughts every day are the same thoughts we had yesterday. Yeah. 91%. And people just rely on that and they do not think critically or creatively. And so when you say, come to me with three, you're elevating your people's ability to do their job. And So I would say there's like a 4A level of they bring you the problem and just say, here's what I think we should do about it. And you may get to that. But at the beginning, you want to hear these three ideas and you want to ingrain in your people that when there's a problem and it's not like the toilet is leaking in the bathroom. Okay, we just need one solution to that. Turn off the water, you know. (laughs) But if it's anything beyond an emergency... Like, let's think of three ways before we get into action. I love that. Well, and then what you should do is if you've got people in your organization, give them a ranking. Like, are they at a one? Are they at a two? Are they at a three? Are they at a four? You probably never even thought about it. You probably never even thought about it because A, you're a problem solving junkie like Sarah and Tiffany. And so you never really thought about it. So just go ahead and rate everyone. Not that you're rating them on a scale of one to five. Like you can be... A very, very good person who's never been taught to come up with solutions doesn't mean you can't come up with solutions, right? So just see what you've got in your organization right now. And then, you know, you really want to work in helping them. First of all, let them listen to this podcast. Say, hey, you know what? I realize I got a lot of DNA in the way our organization is run. I'm the junkie here and I'm really sorry about that. So here, I want you to listen to this podcast and you tell me where you think you are. Ooh, I love that. Yeah. That's spot on, Wendy. I think too, like identifying problems can also be a skill. I have realized it's a skill. So praising them, like if they have, they didn't ignore it, right? They identified it. They spoke up. Empowering them, like what I learned to do was empowering them to say, hey, you're really good at identifying problems and thank you for coming to me about it. Like, thank you. I want to now empower you to move to the next stage. Like, so make it positive. Like in your development, the next stage after you've gotten really good at identifying problems is to think of a solution, right? And so like moving them through the development and looking at it as a way to empower them to do the problem solving and actually like take action on it is huge. Well, guys, today has been amazing. Great job on this framework, Tiffany. I loved it. I've never, I've actually never seen anything like this before. So kudos to you with this amazing original content. 
And um, I personally learned a lot. And I know I'm going to move through my organization really thinking about this and how I can help people get to the next level. So if you guys remember, we've got our five stages of how to deal with problems. Stage one is they ignore the problems. They don't communicate them. Stage two is at least they're communicating them. Three, they're communicating them and they're bringing you at least three ideas, right? Three ideas. And then stage four, they're communicating the problem. They come up with three ideas and then they're recommending one plan of action. And then number five, and this is the stage where they earn the right to do this with you, is they communicate the problem, the three ideas, and then they go ahead and solve it. So today was amazing. And I just want to take a second and thank all of you listeners out there. You know, I think a while ago we realized we weren't getting that many ratings and reviews anymore because we simply forgot to ask for them. And we've gotten so many lately. So I just want to thank you all our listeners for taking the time, taking a minute, giving us that rating and review because it really helps a lot. So again, great job on this episode, Tiffany. I loved it. And you guys go out there and continue to build your big business and even bigger life. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.